Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Previously on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. In October 2002, the nation was on edge. Still reeling from the 9-11 attacks the year before, the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., was wound up tight. And then, suddenly, people started dropping dead. They were being shot by an unknown sniper who seemed to choose them at random. Because of the beltway that goes around Washington, they're sometimes called the beltway sniper attacks, also the D.C. sniper attacks. And they received nonstop 24-7 news coverage for three weeks terrifying the nation. Was this a new and frightening case of Islamic terrorism? Who were the D.C. snipers, and how were they finally caught? The D.C. sniper beltway shootings were an agonizing three-week period. Law enforcement faced a massive challenge trying to sort through the avalanche of tips and catch them, but with careful sleuthing, they were able to put the pieces together and identify John Muhammad and Lee Malvo as the perpetrators. And with the help of a heroic refrigeration specialist, they were then caught almost immediately and brought to justice. You're listening to episode 264 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about what the public didn't know about the DC Beltway sniper's case, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Last week, we told you about the DC Beltway sniper's case from back in the year 2002. But Jimmy said that there was something the public didn't know about the case. So what was happening behind the scenes? What implications does it have? And how often do things of this type happen? And that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Jimmy, last week in episode 263, we talked about what the public knew about the D.C. Beltway sniper's case at the time. But you said that this week we would talk about what the public didn't know and you promised a big surprise. So what's the surprise? Well, you don't have to be psychic to guess what it is, not if you've seen the artwork for this week's episode. But what the public didn't know, because the police didn't announce it, is that they were working with a psychic to help crack the D.C. Sniper's case, and we're going to be talking with her in today's episode. Her name is Pam Coronado, and she's a remote viewer. We've talked about remote viewing in several episodes, but we introduced it back in episodes 102 and 103, so you can go back and listen to those episodes for a general discussion of the subject. As we've discussed before, remote viewing began as part of the Defense Department's Stargate Psychic Spying Program, But remote viewing has many applications, including helping law enforcement and finding missing people. Pam Coronado has an extensive background in those areas. She has helped dozens of law enforcement agencies. And today she's going to tell us about what happened in the D.C. sniper case. She'll also be telling us about her own work with law enforcement. And she'll be telling us about other psychics who also help the police. So without further ado, here's my interview with psychic detective. Pam Coronado. Pam Coronado, star of the Discovery Channel's popular series Sensing Murder, has been involved in criminal, psychic criminal work since 1996, when a dream provided her with the information needed to help a search party locate a missing woman in California. Since then, she has consulted as a psychic detective to large and small police departments, state, federal, international, and private agencies. Pam has demonstrated her skills on live television for several networks, including A&E, Biography Channel, and the Discovery Channel. Extensive training has enabled her to use a wide variety of tools, including controlled remote viewing, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and psychometry to gain insight into a crime or missing persons case. Pam is past president of IRVA, the International Remote Viewing Association, And she is co-founder of the Fowler O'Sullivan Foundation, which helps families who have missing persons who are hikers. Pam Coronado, welcome to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Thank you. Glad to be here. So um, last episode, we covered what the public knew about the D.C. Beltway sniper case. 
when did you first hear about the case? Was it through the news media? The, the first I heard about the DC sniper case, um, absolutely. I think I was hearing about that on the on the news. And um, how did you become involved in the case? I had a working relationship with um, an FBI agent. So I had already established a working relationship with an FBI agent there in DC. And so we got to um, having a conversation about that and then started, um, you know, talking back and forth about what I felt was going on and what was uh, where this was all going. And how early was that? The case itself took about 13 days to play out. Were you contacted or in conversation with your FBI friend from the from day one, or was it a bit after that? It was probably about, um, maybe it, it must have been around day two, because there, there had been a couple of shootings by the time um, he started asking me questions about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And initially, after the first shooting, they didn't even know that it was a pattern yet. So it took a while for them to realize that. Right. Now, one of the things that a lot of remote viewers are concerned about when they begin investigating a target is what is called front loading. Front loading is information that you know about the target before you start viewing it. And many remote viewers want to avoid front loading as much as possible so that they're not distracted by what they've been told about the target. They want just the information to come through psychically. They don't want distractions from what they've been told. Did you have a problem with front loading in this case since it was all over the news media? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Um, it was, you know, there were so many unknowns that, of course, that was fine. I could work on the unknowns, um, kind of focusing on who who was doing this, why they were doing this, where this was going. Uh, because in the very, very beginning, I, I told them there would be 13 victims. But, um, but there were definitely times where what was happening in the news media was, was interfering with my work because uh, one of the examples of that was that I just made the assumption that they already had the vehicle. So I just went off the assumption they already knew what the vehicle was. And so I went and jumped on the white box truck <laughs> train. Uh, I didn't even bother to look at it to see if I saw a different vehicle. What were the initial psychic impressions that you got about this case? You mentioned you had an impression that there would be 13 victims before it was over. Um, what else did you sense about it? I sensed that there were two uh, two males. One was older, uh, more like a father figure, and that um, he was kind of running the show and the younger one was sort of following his lead. I did feel like uh, it's interesting because I was very confused and the agent didn't believe part of what I was telling him was that I felt like they were, um, yeah, I heard the name Muhammad. So I heard the name Muhammad in my head and I saw the dark skin. And so I made the leap to, well, they must be Middle Eastern. Um, and that, <clears throat> you know, was also one of my CRV mistakes. But um, they, uh, I knew that there was some metaphysical, the part that was really confusing was that I, felt and knew there was some sort of metaphysical knowledge, um, which didn't fit in with my concept of being Middle Eastern. So I couldn't really figure out why. Uh, I was really has struggling with that part. And so were they. So, so were they. But um, there was evidence that, that kept coming forth to show that these guys were were – metaphysically minded metaphysical in the new age sense as opposed to the academic philosophical sense just a knowledge of of concepts um the fact that they were throwing tarot cards down at the crime scenes um that there was some symbology around um michael's uh, every every crime that happened every shooting that happened was 
which, you know, wasn't put out in the public, but it was happening within a quarter, I think it was a quarter mile or half a mile of um, a Michael's store. Um, so there was a lot of symbology and a lot of things, clues that they were throwing out and they were relatively frustrated because law enforcement didn't understand the clues and puzzle pieces that they were throwing out. So um, they definitely wanted um, to throw out some of these confusing clues to the to law enforcement, but law enforcement didn't understand. They didn't understand what uh, what they meant. I've heard you mention before, you also got impressions that the two men lived together, that they were poor, um, that they were focused on Michaels in some way, and that they were working a kind of unpredictable random pattern, shooting random victims. And by doing that, they were trying to play a kind of cat and mouse game with law enforcement, where they'd give them some clues, but also they would shoot unpredictable people unpredictably so they didn't have a standard mo of who they were targeting um those were all things that you uh you reported to your friend in the fbi yeah basically that they were they were intentionally yes absolutely intentionally trying to be as random as possible um so that there couldn't be a discernible pattern they were doing that on purpose for sure but they were also reacting to what was happening in the news. So they were watching the news reports and then they were reacting from the news reports. So I kept trying to caution them about what they were saying and, and releasing on the news because they were reactive to that. How stressful was this case for you working on it? Because this was, you know, something that terrified a lot of people all across America, even people who weren't in the DC area. I can imagine there must have been a lot of pressure on, I know there was a lot of pressure on law enforcement. I can imagine there would have been a lot of pressure on you as well. Is that accurate? Yes, a lot. Yeah. Because, um, well, and, and keep in mind with law enforcement, law enforcement was a tricky deal because there were so many agencies involved. So it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just the FBI. There were, you know, the local jurisdictions and, uh, even jurisdictions from different states and counties. And so there were so many cooks in the kitchen. There was a lot of uh, confusion kind of just from that standpoint. But there was a lot of uh, pressure to try to get in front of these guys. So I could always tell you what they were planning next. They were really easy to read for some reason. Um, I could usually tell you what they were going to do next, but I couldn't pinpoint where. So that was really stressful for me, is kind of knowing what they were up to and what they were planning, but not being able to pinpoint. Like I knew they were going to shoot somebody at a bus stop, but, you know, I couldn't identify which bus stop. I knew they were going to shoot at a child. Uh, so I knew these things, but I couldn't get out in front of where, where, so they could um, hopefully, you know, intervene. Now, um, later, as the case developed, you received some additional psychic impressions. Uh, you mentioned one of them. You perceived that there was going to be a victim shot at a bus stop. And in fact, he was the final victim. Uh, he was a bus driver who was standing on the steps of his bus when, uh, when he was uh, targeted. Um, what were some of the other impressions that you got as the case developed? I know that one of them involved Michael's, the store. Right. Um, so with Michael's, um, I kept feeling like, you know, investigators thought that he was at first, they thought they were disgruntled Michael's employees or something. They couldn't figure out what the Michael's connection was either, uh, in the beginning. Um, And so when I looked at it to see what I felt that was about, um, I kept feeling like it was a a nod to to Archangel Michael, who is the protector of law enforcement. Um, So I actually felt like it was a little bit of a veiled threat, which plays out later. 
uh, to be true. So that was that. But I also kept hearing um, 41. So I kept hearing 41. And of course, um, I think um, the second Michael's, yeah, it was the second Michael's attack was uh, number 41. Or so, I can't remember if it was number 41 or if it was the zip code 20041. It was something like that. What I have is it was in zip code uh, 20041. Yeah. Um, so after the two individuals were captured, John Muhammad and, and Lee Boyd Malvo, um, another aspect of the case that was somewhat metaphysical came up. And it happened when you were talking to one officer about Malvo that they were trying to interrogate and Malvo really wasn't giving them any kind of useful information. He kind of clammed up. And so your friend said, how do I get this guy to open up? What did you tell him at that point? Yeah. Um, I told him that, that they believed they were smarter than everyone. Um, and that the only way to get him to, to gain, he was going to have to gain his respect because otherwise they weren't going to say a word. So I did recommend that they start speaking about metaphysical subjects. So I did recommend that they talk about things that obviously these guys were trying to throw out all these clues. So um, respond to that. And that's what got them to, that's what got him to open up. He started talking about um, Matrix, the Matrix. And he said that they would sit at the bus stop, the, the truck stops at night, and they would watch that movie. They'd watch the news on their computer, and they would watch that movie. So I think they watched that movie every single night or something uh, like that. So when he started mentioning um, that kind of thing, then they, the floodgates opened. And they kind of fantasized about being Neo and Morpheus from the movie. I believe so. I believe so. What okay. what happened was they had a they had a screen they had a grand plan. So so they they in their mind there were phases. There were phases. So this was phase one. Shooting shooting civilians randomly was phase one. But they were getting if they didn't get what they wanted, they were going to amp up to phase two, which we've learned all of this from their interviews. From uh, phase two, they were going to start um, shooting law enforcement. So they're going to ramp up the terror level by starting to shoot at law enforcement. So, um, and that's what they were indicating with trying to indicate some of the clues they were leaving in notes and cards and things like that. But that's, you know, where they were headed with it is what they were intending. Any other insights about this case you want to share with us, the D.C. Beltway sniper case in particular? Um, gosh, it's been so long. Um, Just 20 years. I don't know if I'm forgetting anything about that one. Is there? Any, did you have any other questions about it? Um, no, I just wanted to see if you had anything you wanted to say about it. Um, not really. I, I, I hope we don't have another situation like that, uh, ever again. I know that Amen. for myself, I have, um, I've done a lot of training since, <laughs> yeah. And since then I've done a lot of training and, um, I, I'm much better at tracking fugitives in, in real time. So I've actually practiced that with a, a, a department that I work with. And um, I've gotten much better at actually real time viewing and being able to track fugitives, you know, much better in real time. So I feel like I would be more equipped if we did have a situation like that. Well, I'm glad you've been able to do that training, but here's hoping we don't. Right. <laughs> Even in this case, though, you had some remarkable hits. Uh, I mean, quite, quite, a, quite a bunch of them. I mean, you got that there would be 13 victims. You got that there would be two older men, one who was older in the mastermind, one who was younger and a follower. You got that they lived together. You got that they were poor. 
you got that they had a knowledge of metaphysics, that Michael's was significant, that they were working a random, unpredictable pattern with random victims as part of a cat and mouse game. You did have a miss when it came to them being Middle Eastern, but that could be understood as, you know, you got the name Muhammad, which turned out to be the name of one of the perpetrators. So putting all that together, that's a really remarkable track record for this case. Thank you. Yeah. So let's talk about your psychic detective work more broadly. How did you become involved in doing psychic detective work in the first place? Uh, I was having a pretty normal life with uh, a husband and three kids and normal Southern California housewife. And I started having very remarkable dreams. And one dream in particular happened to be uh, where I was riding in the backseat of a car with a man and a woman in front of me. And the man in the dream turned around and um, glared at me. And I knew him to be my husband, only in the dream, you know, uh, in the dream, he was my husband. But of course, I'd never laid eyes on this person before. So I realized I was dreaming through somebody else's eyes at that time. And I also realized that they were getting ready to kill me, that I was in grave danger. And um, and as we were driving along in this car, I looked out the window and saw an angel flying out the window. And she was motioning for me to come with her. And so I decided uh, that was better than where I was. <laughs> so I... Uh, like Peter Pan and Wendy flew out the window. Uh, and as I was w with her, I, I could look back and see um, the car. So I could see the road, I could see the vehicle. Um, and then we flew off into a place that I could only describe was, was um, her Christian vision of heaven, the victim. So, um, so I woke up. And I was rattled because it was such a strange and powerful dream. Of course, I recorded it. And then um, about three days later, I was reading the newspaper. We still had newspapers then. And I was reading the newspaper and um, I saw a picture of the guy in my dream. So he, he uh, him and his girlfriend were staring back at me from the newspaper and the uh, title said that him and his, him and his mistress were suspects because his wife was missing. So his wife was missing and they were suspects. And so in that moment, um, my whole world shifted because <laughs> I knew that I had dreamed her last moments and I had an idea of where she was, um, and I did not want to tell anyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I really did not want to uh, confess to anybody that I had had this dream. Eventually, obviously, I did. Obviously, mm -hmm. I came forward and did that. And her name was Sherry Daly. Sherry Daly. Mm -hmm. And her husband, Michael. Yeah. And they were eventually able to recover her remains. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the day that I, I eventually got brave and joined the search party and they found her remains that day. Now, at this point, so that was in 1996, and that was the first time you were involved in a case helping law enforcement. Um, but that was, you know, almost 30 years ago now. By this point, how many cases have you worked and for how many agencies? Oh, God. Um, I have worked hundreds of cases. Yeah, I don't know if I have a count on exactly how many agencies. Um, probably at least 50, somewhere in there, maybe. I've got, I know I've got 30 patches. <laughs> I've got 30 patches behind me. And you were very kind to send us a photograph of some of the patches that you have framed. And there were 24 patches in the frames. And they're also behind you on the wall. Yeah. Um, 
And so I knew there were at least 24 yeah. agencies. So it was in the dozens. And you estimate maybe 50 at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Because those, you know, those I had. And then I, I had a show when I did Sensing Murder, of course, that's 11. You know, we had 11 episodes there. Um, so and then there's been countless cases I've worked on behind the scenes, small cases that nobody's ever heard of, that kind of stuff. In hearing you speak on this subject before, you mentioned something that I found absolutely fascinating, which was a way of establishing credibility with a police department. So, you know, let's say there is a police department these days because you've been on sensing murder and other things like that. Uh, a lot of agencies will already know who you are, but you figured out a way to demonstrate credibility to a police department that you hadn't worked with before. Tell us about how you would go about doing that. Well, I've always told them uh, I was willing, oh, ready and willing to test. So I've always expressed to them that I was willing to test um, so they could give me a case that was solved. Um, and then I would do my best to answer the questions based on on the things that they know so they could check my work against the known facts. And um, the more known facts that I can give them, the more trust they're going to have in me in the parts that they don't know. So that's the way that I've always recommended for law enforcement is to go ahead and test. Um, if you have an intuitive that's not willing to test, um, you know, that that could be a problem. I think this is a very, uh, very good way of building trust with the police department. If they take a case where they already know all the answers, but you don't and and let the psychic uh, see how much accurate information they can come up with versus how much inaccurate information. And that'll give the police a sense of, is this person reliable? And then if they are reliable, they can they could trust them to start working cases where the police don't already know all the answers. So I thought that was a very creative, productive approach. Thank you. Um, I would love to take credit for it, but I can't. <laughs> so you got it from someone else. Yeah, I got that from um, from a detective that I worked with, and they were writing a book called Psychic Criminology. So they talked about that. They they referred, um, you know, that was a. Uh, that was a method that they always encouraged law enforcement. So it's a book called Psychic Criminology, and that's where that idea came from. Okay. When you're working a case, uh, do you take steps to avoid front loading or information about the case that is already known? Or what degree of information do you want to have on a case? I am very task oriented. So the only thing I want to know is what they want from me generally. So I, if they are looking for a missing person, I usually request a photo of the, the person. Um, I don't need their name. They can give me a first name if they want. Normally I don't ask for a name. I just want the photo and that's all I want to know. I just want to know that we're looking for a location. Um, and that's what I need. If they're working on a homicide, I just need to know what it is they're after. If they're after uh, a description of the crime itself, if they're looking for the perpetrator, if they're looking for a vehicle, I just need to know what they're wanting from me so, um, so that I can, you know, laser focus in on what it is that they, that they need. So when you're working a case, um, what psychic methodologies do you use to get information? I know one of them is remote viewing, and we've talked about remote viewing previously on the podcast, but I understand you use some other methods as well. What might those be? Um, I use uh, clairvoyance and clairaudience. Those are the two big ones. I, use, I also use psychometry. Psychometry mm -hmm. is the art of holding an object. Um, that belongs to the victim or someone and then being able to perceive information um, from that object. So I do, I did that on sensing murder. So they wouldn't um, give me a photograph of the person until I adequately described them. So they would just hand me something like car keys or 
some object and then I would have to describe the victim. And once I described the victim, then they would go ahead and give me a picture. Um, so psychometry is a skill that I use and um, CRV, of course, and um, just full straight clairvoyance and clairaudience. Now, uh, not all the listeners may be familiar with those terms. How would you distinguish clairvoyance from controlled remote viewing or CRV? How are they similar? How are they different? It's such a great question because people are confused about this a lot. <laughs> the way I always describe the clairs, clairaudience, clairvoyance, is that they are the building blocks. So that no matter what kind of work you're trying to do, if you're trying to be a medium or you're trying to be a psychic detective or you're doing remote viewing, the impressions have to come in a certain way. And they come in either visually, which is clear audience, clairvoyance, or they come in uh, as thoughts um, or sounds that you hear. And that would be clear audience. And then uh, clairsentience, which is feeling. So a lot of times remote viewers will get um, feeling impressions as well. So that's the only way information comes in. You're either going to see it, you're going to hear it, or you're going to feel it. And how you use it from that point is what makes the difference. So in CRV, CRV is just a tool to help you um, manage those impressions as, and organize those impressions. It's sort of a way of structuring the experience in a systematic way. Yeah. So um, how do you work a typical case? You get a contact, I imagine, from law enforcement and they say, we have a case. Um, let's say it's a, a, a murder case where someone's been killed and we have certain information, but we are needing help. What steps do you take? How do you how do you go about assisting them? So normally I just request a photo of the uh, person in question, the uh, victim usually. And I'll either work by myself or I work with a monitor. So I have a detective friend who I met probably 15, 20 years ago on a case. And she's a fantastic monitor. For those who don't know what a monitor is, she will... Um, ask me questions and then I'll just verbally answer. So we'll, we'll go through the entire who, what, why, when, and where, um, with her asking me questions. And then I just feed her those answers and it's always recorded. Um, so the bulk of my work is done either on audio or video, you know, for, um, for the record. And do you then write a written report based on that, or do you just give the raw files to law enforcement for them to review? It depends on what they want. If they want a summary, I'll write a summary. Um, so I can write a summary and sort of summarize, here's the who, what, why, when, and where. Um, you know, see, see the details uh, so they don't have to go through pages and pages. They're super busy, so they don't have to go through pages and pages of of uh, my data, but um, generally they do prefer the audio video. Uh, most of them prefer the audio video. Do you ever work with other psychics on a case? I know that sometimes there may be more than one psychic working a particular case. Is that something you, you do or is it something you don't do? Um, I work with my own people sometimes so i teach um i teach mm -hmm. students and so i know who has certain skills certain like this person is a fantastic sketch artist say and she's really good at sketching suspect faces so i will work with somebody um like that so i tend to work with people that i've trained and i know that their skill set is and i know that they're have some Nobody's going to be 100% accurate. It's just not possible. But but knowing that this person has a consistency, you know, that they're reliable and I can pretty much trust their information. Um, groups, it, it's, it's tricky working in groups because there's this bleed through where people start 
picking up on each other's thoughts, um, that can be a problem. And a lot of times law enforcement will get frustrated if they are talking to two different psychics that um, may have completely different point of view. And so sometimes that can be, uh, sometimes that can be an issue for law enforcement. I always tell them, make sure that person was vetted and tested before Mm -hmm. uh, you decide who you want to work with. Have you ever had to testify in a court case about the psychic aspect of your work? Well, I almost had to testify, but it was because the person said some incriminating things to me while I was out there working on the search. So it it was as a regular, it would have been as a regular witness, but not, um, they do not, they do not consider psychic information as testimony. I haven't seen that. So, um, you know, thankfully I'm glad that the court relies on hard evidence. <laughs> they rely on hard evidence. And so that's as it should be. Yeah, I can imagine how a defense attorney would love to get a psychic on the stand under cross-examination and use that to impeach the prosecution's case. I mean, look at look at these look at these prosecutors. They have no case. They're relying on psychics and that could be very damaging to the prosecution. So I can imagine that um that law enforcement would not want to have to bring a psychic into court. Um which raises another question, which is how does law enforcement feel about you talking about these cases now that they're done? Are they OK with that or, you know, are are they not? I it depends on, you know, I usually ask them. So I usually ask ahead of time if how they feel about me talking about a particular case. But generally, if a case has been through the courts it's, it's, it's open, you know, it's, it's all public record anyway. But, um, but usually I have a good rapport with my detectives and I ask them how they feel about me, um, coming out publicly about any work that I've done with them. Um, are all psychics suited to do this kind of work with law enforcement or is it something that it's okay for some psychics to do it? They're psychically or emotionally or mentally equipped, but other psychics might not be. Is this something for everybody or is it really something you need to have some special qualities to do? Yeah, it's really not for everybody. Some people, um, and I know some really talented psychics who are uh, just not cut out for the content. They're just too sensitive. It it just keeps them up at night, bothers them way too much, and they just they just cannot handle the content of it. So anybody who um, is just overwhelmed, emotionally overwhelmed with the content is not going to do uh, well in this field, no matter how talented they are. Yeah, because they're going to be psychically accessing or maybe seeing with their own eyes crime scenes and human remains and disturbing scenarios. And so I can imagine a lot of people would say, I just, I, I, that's not my thing. You know, I had a a detective say this to me uh, on one of my cases, you know, I was describing, I was describing a crime scene and I was describing what was happening. And I was describing the screaming that I could hear and the succession of gunshots and the dog barking and all of these sounds. And he was looking at me just horrified. He was just looking at me horrified. And I said, um, you know what? And he said, he said, I would not want to be you for anything. He said, when I get to the crime scene, it's all quiet. <laughs> There's no, it's already over with. It's quiet. I don't have to hear, hear those sounds. So, uh, so that really, that really affected me because I realized, you know, yeah, you are, you are witnessing some really, really horrible and disturbing things, but it was the FBI that taught me to, to stand back and, and be the observer and not get overly engaged or 
attached to what was happening and just watch it from the observer point of view, which is hard to do. It took a long time to learn how to do that. How common is it for law enforcement agencies to work with psychics? I mean, have you ever run across any, for example, that just utterly refuse to? Um, I have not. There are some departments that are not super friendly. They're known for being what we call unfriendly. Usually the bigger the department, like uh, let's just say LAPD, (laughs) uh, they're unfriendlies. But but the sheriff's department is not. They're friendly. Um, So most departments, um, 99% of them that I've come across have worked with a psychic in some capacity. So it's really, really common. They just don't put it out there. There's a couple of reasons they don't put it out there. One is, you know, the old fashioned giggle factor is still alive. Um, The other thing is they don't want to be perceived as as a friendly, as we call them, the friendlies, because they don't want to get overrun by unsolicited calls. So if they put it out there that they work with the psychic, then 60 other psychics are going to call them up and tell them how to do their job. That leads to my next question, uh, which is, I mean, and it's, by the way, I just want to comment, 99% working with psychics in some capacity, that's, that's really impressive. Um, that's very widespread. And it, even though the data may be anecdotal, it's still really impressive data. Um, and I would understand why they wouldn't want to talk about it for both mm-hmm. of the reasons you just named. The They could be mocked and then also they could be overrun because lots of people have psychic impressions. I mean, you'll have people be sitting at home. They're listening to the news. They hear about some major case that's in the news and suddenly they have a psychic impression and they want to report it to law enforcement. So from law enforcement's perspective, though, that's not necessarily a help. Uh, As I discussed in the previous episode last week. One of the complicating factors in the D.C. sniper case was they got like over 100,000 leads that people phoned in. And some of the leads that were accurate never got followed up on because they were just overloaded. So what do, in your experience, what do police departments not want from psychics? They do not appreciate those unsolicited calls. especially if you call with vague information. So if you call, I know for a psychic, they get very excited because they're like, I have the answer. I know, I know this little piece, but for law enforcement, that's really um, frustrating to have them call and say, I see a path in the woods. That's not helpful. And um, it's a waste of their time and they get really irritated with that. (laughs) So uh, they don't like those unsolicited calls. They really don't um, appreciate them. Can you imagine being, uh, I usually use the analogy of being a mechanic working on a celebrity's car and then all these random people calling you and telling you how to fix the car, <laughs> how to fix the car. Oh, it's something like that. But um, they they don't, they also want you to, um, you know, I always say, act normal, be professional. Um, They don't want you to walk in and tell them that they are talking to their dead grandma and start giving them information about their personal life. Some psychics will do that to try to gain some credibility. Don't do that. (laughs) Um, That will put them off. That definitely will put them off. It would be better to work a solved case. And for no them. tarot cards on the desk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would be better to yes. work a solved case for them rather than start telling them information about their personal life. That if you want to establish a professional relationship. Correct. Yeah. So what do police want? Um, so basically, I always say act like you would on any job interview. You're going to act like a professional um, they 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 want facts. They want 
uh, actionable leads. So they want actionable leads. They want something that they could follow up on. So I always tell people, if you're thinking of calling the police, which I don't recommend, you know, look at what you have in front of you. Would you be able to follow up on that? If, just look at your own stuff objectively. Would you be able to follow up on this? Um, and if the answer is no, then don't expect them to. So I think a lot of people have this idealistic view that that law enforcement somehow, you know, well, they're detectives. It's their job to figure it out, you know. Um, well, no, they're down there chasing hard leads, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> um, it's not their job to figure out what you saw. Also, I know that um, uh, law enforcement agencies might not want to work with a psychic who turns around and starts talking to the media while the case is still active. They want a certain amount of discretion on the part of a psychic, while at least while a case is active. Is that accurate? Yes. So I have been asked to sign non-disclosures on some cases, and um, but usually it's it's a it's just a verbal agreement about what is going to be said and not said in the public. There are definitely times where they used me uh, as, as uh, a bait a little bit and they put it out there in the public on purpose. So there have been times where um, they did that intentionally. Okay. Now, when a psychic becomes involved in a case, it would be wonderful if psychics could just name the perpetrator immediately. Um, and Sometimes you'll hear about psychics saying they solved a case. Is that accurate? Do psychics really solve cases or do they just help solve cases? They provide puzzle pieces. Psychics provide pieces of the puzzle. Uh, law enforcement solve cases. Law enforcement are the ones who have to come up with the hard evidence. They're the ones that have to go to deport and defend the evidence that they have. Um, yes, an intuitive can come up with some information that gets them in the right place or uh, describes the right person or whatever it is. But, you know, law enforcement are still the ones who are um, solving cases, in my opinion. And even if a psychic did come in and, and on the first day name the perpetrator, that doesn't prove the perpetrator did it. That just gives the police someone to look at. They still need to build the evidential case to show the person did it. So there's a lot of detective work that goes into that. Yeah, I could stand there and I've done it. I could stand there and say it's next door. Your, your suspect lives next door. Um, and I have actually done that on case where I said he lives there. I know where I know he lives there. Uh, but they still had to prove it. They still had to come up with the evidence. So, um, so it's, I don't wave a magic wand. You know, it's just they have to still come up with the, the evidence. Given the disturbing nature of the material that a lot of police cases involve, especially the kinds that they bring you in to consult on, what motivates you to do this work? What kind of rewards do are there that would lead you to put up with some of the disturbing content? Um, the families. It's really, I feel like um, I've met so many of these families and I've worked with so many of these families and they are um, so traumatized. And I just feel like, you know, if I was in their shoes, I would want somebody to, to do everything in their power to help me. And, um, and there's just something about somebody being in such a traumatized state that I just desperately want to, you know, help them find answers or justice or feel like somebody cares and somebody's really um, working to help them, especially in the missing person cases, missing person cases, especially because um, law enforcement will eventually pull back all their resources after a certain amount of time and that family is still sitting there with nothing. Um, and so to know that somebody is still helping them and out there, I do work with a lot of search and rescue teams. 
So to know that there are people out there that are still trying, is just, you know, so important to them. And that leads into your work with the Fowler O'Sullivan Foundation to help people who have missing persons who are hikers. Yeah, the Fowler Foundation was founded so for people who are lost in wilderness and extreme conditions. So a lot of that translates to hikers. Um, we started off focusing on the Pacific Crest Trail, uh, PCT, but we've expanded to other other um, types of cases too. But um, yeah, that's that's an extreme. Those are, cases are extremely difficult. Well, is there, um, thank you very much for joining us on Mysterious World. Is there anything else you'd like us to know or anything you'd like to pitch? Um, As far as pitching, you know, I teach classes. Uh, Anybody who's interested in doing this work, you know, I do teach classes so that they can kind of try it out in a safe environment and see if it is something that they enjoy, if they do have a, a knack for it, that kind of thing. So um, I do try to provide a safe environment for people who are having these kinds of experiences and they don't know what to do with them. So I, um, I have ongoing classes all the time for that. And I do teach a lot of um, just intuitive development and CRV and, and that kind of thing. So I'm 24-7 talking, thinking, doing uh, intuitive work. Okay. And we'll have a link to your website so people can uh, read more about that and learn about the classes that you teach. Perfect. Thank you. So Pam Coronado, thank you very much for joining us here on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to finally meet you. Likewise. All right, and that's the interview with Pam Coronado. Uh, Before we get to the rest of our show, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including James L., Tom O., Aaron D., Amy G., and Lee H. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fairvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com, F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. And by delivercontacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices, With free delivery, visit DeliverContacts.com. Jimmy, let's take a quick look at what Pam Coronado told us today from the faith and reason perspectives. What should we say from the reason perspective? The existence of psychic functioning is obviously controversial in many circles, and not everybody believes in it. But if it does exist, then it could be a benefit to law enforcement agencies and people who have been seeking missing persons. Some law enforcement officers do believe it exists and that it's helpful enough to risk the potential embarrassment or career difficulties of bringing psychics onto a case, which is saying something. I was particularly impressed by uh, Pam saying that 99% of the police departments she's aware of have worked with psychics in some capacity. Also, I've heard her say before that law enforcement officers often put dowsing in a different category than other psychic disciplines. Uh, We discussed dowsing back in episode 246, and again in episode 247, where we talked with remote viewer and dowser Paul Smith. And it does seem that dowsing is more acceptable to some people than other psychic disciplines. So perhaps this can explain why police officers put it in kind of a different category. And of course, dowsing also could be useful to help law enforcement cases and in finding missing people. Typically, law enforcement tends to use psychics like other government agencies do. Back during the Stargate program, agencies frequently would use the Stargate psychics only when they'd run into a wall. If they could get the information they needed through normal means, that's what they'd do. And they'd then turn to Stargate if they were having trouble getting the information they needed. The same thing tends to be true of law enforcement agencies. Psychics often aren't their first resort. 
Uh, if they can get the information they need through natural means, they do that. But if they can't, many of them are open to working with psychics, even if they don't talk about it publicly that much. Now, what can we say about psychic detective work from the faith perspective? As we discussed in episode 79 on magic, religion, psychic phenomena, and science, psychic functioning is held to be a set of weak natural abilities that are part of human nature. Uh, the church has no teaching on whether psychic abilities exist one way or the other, so that's a matter to be settled by science. Even though it's not a matter of church teaching, though, there is a history of important Catholic thinkers believing in psychic abilities, including saints and doctors of the church, like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. As we discussed in episodes 105 and again in episode 106 on St. Thomas Aquinas and the occult, both St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas believed in what we today would call precognition. St. Thomas Aquinas referred to it as natural prophecy to distinguish it from the supernatural prophecy that God gives. St. Thomas also believed in what we today would call psychokinesis. Now, I haven't, at least yet, come across texts from this period endorsing remote viewing or clairvoyance, but if abilities like precognition and psychokinesis exist, there's no reason why clairvoyance or remote viewing shouldn't exist too. If such abilities exist, they are something that God built into human nature, and that would suggest that they do have legitimate uses, and using such abilities to do good, like find missing people and help catch criminals, would seem to be a very worthy use of them from the faith perspective, as in the DC Sniper case. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line here? The DC Sniper's case, as it was known by the public at the time, is already fascinating, but it's even more fascinating when you know the other side of the story and what Pam Coronado did to help. Her career as a psychic detective is also fascinating, and law enforcement agencies she's worked with have obviously thought that she's been able to help them. Otherwise, they would never have worked with her so many times, literally dozens of times. And she's not the only such psychic, since there are many psychics helping law enforcement. And it's fascinating to have a peek into this little talked about world. Anything else we want to say before we close? I want to say a special word of thanks to Pam Coronado for coming on the show today and helping us understand the fascinating world of psychic detectives. And here's hoping that she and others will be able to help the police solve many more crimes and find many missing people. And Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listener and viewer? We'll have a link to uh, Pam Coronado's TV series, Sensing Murder, and also her website, pamcoronado.com. Great. That's it from us this time. What are your theories about the DC Beltway snipers, Pam Coronado, and other psychic detectives? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work on this episode. You can see the kind of work they do and how much it adds to the podcast by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, I am trying to grow my channel. So I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you always get a notification whenever we release an episode of Mysterious World or one of the other videos I release. Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week is a fifth Friday, so we're going to be answering weird questions on topics like the Mandela effect, the Nephilim and the biblical figure of Og, asking obscure saints for their intercession, Padre Pio and time travel prayer, Captain Kirk, transporters and sacraments, agents of shield, AI and souls, atom-sized relics of Jesus, time travel and divination, murder and the seal of confession, and more. Folks, be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at MysteriousWorldStore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show. 
You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 264. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Tim Shevlin's Personal Fitness Training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness through personalized nutrition, workout and prayer programs, and daily accountability check-ins. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Thank you.